villain then. Okay. I think I'm good. At Uh, hello everyone, um, if I can get your attention. Uh, welcome to the second event of the Hopes for One conference this year. Uh, we're glad to have Karen Allen with us from Biomimicry 3.8 in Bend, Oregon. Karen works uh, at a satellite office in Bend where the main office is in Helena, Montana. Uh, she also lectures the master's program at the Biomimicry 3.8 and also the new online program at Arizona State University. Um, we're really glad to have this with her here with us, uh, please give a warm welcome to Karen Allen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, I'm really appreciative to be included in the HOPES conference this year. I wanted to start by showing an image of the most efficient water distribution system on Earth. Has anybody ever really looked at the veins in a leaf? Raise your hand. Yeah, good, because they're everywhere, right? They're out there everywhere. We're surrounded by them. Leaf veins follow Murray's Law, and that's a mathematical formula that describes branching patterns in the natural world, branching patterns like our own circulatory system, right, that, that um, uh, circulates blood through our arteries and veins 24-7. So Murray's Law works like this. The larger pipes branch into smaller pipes. The smaller pipes branch into even smaller pipes at predictable diameters. So there's predictable dimensions to this. So why is this branching pattern ubiquitous in the natural world? Because it's an efficient distribution system. And architects and builders are starting to look at all the 90 degree bends in our pipes and saying, hmm, maybe if we emulated Murray's law in our plumbing systems that transport water and our ductwork that transports air, maybe that would be an a more efficient system. I was very blessed to be raised in a glass house with an undulating roof line. And this is the view out the living room. This is 17 vertical feet floor to ceiling glass that looks out into the Black Oaks. This is in Sonoma County, Northern California. And when my parents bought this house in 1965, the architect who designed and built it had been trying to sell it for two years. And he said, nobody wants to buy it because they can't figure out how they're going to put curtains and fit curtains on these windows. And of course, my parents laughed. And really, he was looking for a family that wanted to fit into this beautiful house that he had so carefully designed to fit into the place. And that place is a black oak Douglas fir woodland. Um, I grew up uh, looking out the window in the morning, watching gray squirrels jump between the trees, and my brothers and I overturned rocks and looked at salamanders and, and uh, grabbed scorpions. And really it was this early experience of being raised in this house that helped move me toward becoming a biologist and a habitat restoration ecologist. It also really gave me an appreciation for design, both design in nature and beautiful aesthetic human design. In the late 90s, I was drawn to this book, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. And this is by Janine Benius. And at the time, she had been gathering newspaper articles that were documenting lots of people around the globe, uh, largely in academia, who were studying nature and then emulating those designs into human designs. And as I read it, I started wondering, what can we learn from nature's designs to sustain ourselves on Earth while protecting and restoring what's still here. Because that preservation and restoration were always so important to me. Um, but then I also started wondering, well, how can I, as a naturalist or a biologist, how can I help translate the natural world 
to the innovators of our world, the designers, the architects, the industrial designers, so that we can emulate nature's strategies in our designs. So I, long story short, I've been working on biomimicry projects for about the last 15 years, and then I've been teaching biomimicry and the practice of biomimicry for the last decade. Oh, I also want to say that I love the acronym for this conf conference, HOPES, because to me that's what biomimicry is, is it gives me hope and it gives me inspiration um, for the possibilities of what we might create um, to cre help create a more sustainable, innovative world. So biomimicry is the conscious emulation of nature's genius. So conscious means that we purposely look toward nature for ideas to then apply to our human designs. Emulation means that we mimic the design principle from the natural world in our designs. And nature's genius implies that she knows what she's doing. Life's been on the planet for 3.8 billion years, and during that time, design flaws haven't persisted. They've become fossils. And what we see around us today is what works and what's appropriate for current environmental conditions. So examples might be emulating the ventilation system in an African termite mound in the East Gate building in Harare, Zimbabwe. And this is what Arab engineers did, um, emulated the, the channels in the termite mounds that allow those mounds to remain at a constant 87 degrees Fahrenheit. And they were able to create this large office building um, in a very hot climate using no air conditioning and using 10% of the energy of a conventional building its size. Or it's mimicking the leading edge of a humpback whale fin to improve efficiencies in wind turbine blades. Or it's mimicking the light gathering ability of chlorophyll to inspire dye sensitized solar cells. Now, despite the fact that we have left our mark on this earth with indelible ink, we are really just one of many. Scientists estimate that there's anywhere from 30 to 100 million species on Earth. Now, only about 1.7 million have been identified and described. Um, so we're largely living on an un undescribed planet, an undiscovered planet. Um, but about 95% of all the species on Earth have gone extinct. The importance of that is that what surrounds us today is what's appropriate for current environmental conditions. The other thing is that we are a very young species. And if we were to take the age of the Earth and compress it into a calendar year, this is a little hard to read, but at the top here is January 1st, and at the bottom of this dark green band is December 31st, on January 1st, 4.5 billion years ago, Earth forms. On February 25th, about 3.8 billion years ago, life appears, the first life appears. Now, photosynthesis occurs on about the spring equinox. And then we've got sexual reproduction occurring about September 17th, and that's important because that's when genes start mixing and we start to increase the diversity of life forms that we're seeing on the planet. Then in November, there's quite a few life forms that show up, fungi, fish, land plants, and arthropods. And then in December, we've got amphibians, reptiles, mammals, um, we've got flowers and birds showing up. So all of those life forms are our elders, because our species, Homo sapiens sapien, doesn't show up until seven minutes before midnight on December 31st. In our industrial age, the last 250 years, occurred within the last two seconds before midnight. So we are a relatively, relatively young species. So biomimicry is about learning life strategies, uh, learning from those elders, uh, and how those elders solve the same challenges that we have. Challenges like cooperating, or using benign chemistry, 
or capturing energy. Because life teaches us what well-adapted designs look like. Life is well-adapted to place, and what we find is that organisms actually enhance the places that they call home, and they encourage other species to flourish. It's what Janine Benius calls life creates conditions conducive to life. So by using biomimicry, we help create well-adapted designs that fit in. So when we emulate nature, we can emulate form, process, or ecosystem. Let me run through what each of these means. So when we emulate form, we're mimicking shape or pattern. It would be like making a water mixer inspired by a lily, or Velcro inspired by the shape of a burr. When we mimic process, think of it as Mimicking the recipe or how something is made. So it might be emulating the, the process of photosynthesis, photosynthesis in a solar panel. And then when we emulate at the system level, like mimicking a wetland or a forest, we're mimicking how the design fits into the larger system that it's a part of. So we think about what is the product or, or thing made of, how does it enrich the system that it's a part of to, to its end use? You know, how are those materials going to be broken down and upcycled rather than ending up in a landfill? I'd like to share a case study from each of these levels. Um, and so a case study is the uh, human design and the biological inspiration. So what do, question for all of you, what do a sunflower, a nautilus, and an unfurling fern have in common? Fibonacci series, golden ratio, spiral geometry, exactly. So spiral geometry is a pervasive pattern in the natural world because that shape allows fluid, fluid and airflow, to travel as fast as possible without transitioning from a laminar to a turbulent flow. It's also a very efficient growth form. Why, do, why are our ears spiral shaped or pine cone spiral? It's very efficient. Pax water mixer, known as the lily, emulates that spiral geometry. Now, a traditional blade or um, motor or fan um, sends fluids out, and it creates cavitation, which creates friction. So it's less efficient than this impeller, um, which pulls water in, um, creating no cavitation. This little device, it's hard to tell from this photo, but it's about six inches tall, four inches wide, and it sits on a four-foot tall tripod in a tank of water and it can mix 10 million gallons on 300 watts. So what they're finding is that this is reducing energy consumption and chemical use by 80% over similar mixers. That's an example of mimicking form, right? Mimicking that spiral geometry. We can also mimic process. So with this example, um, this kind of gets at uh, all the concern now about climate change and all the CO2 that we're cranking out into the atmosphere. And it begs the question of what do other organisms do with CO2? Well, plants photosynthesize. They take in CO2 and water in the presence of sunlight, and they make leaves and wood and stems and food that we eat, right? Marine organisms also take in CO2, and they lay down a car calcium carbonate shell through a process called biomineralization. Now, over millions of years, when those shells in the ocean fall to the bottom of the ocean and get exposed to enough heat and pressure, they eventually lithify, turn into rock, and they form limestone, right? So limestone is essentially fossilized calcium carbonate shells. Now let me transition to the human world. One of the most common building materials is concrete. And concrete uses cement as a glue. Anybody know how we make cement? 
we mine limestone, we heat it up to 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit, we release a ton of CO2 for every ton of cement manufactured. So what if, instead of the mining and the burning, what if we bypass that whole process and used our excess CO2 from our coal-fired power plants and did that same process of biomineralization that marine organisms do? A company called Calera has a demonstration in Moss Landing, California, on the coast of Northern California near Carmel, and they're... Um, they're taking CO2 that's coming out of coal-fired power plants. They're mixing it with seawater and adding a catalyst, um, carbonic anhydrase, and they're precipitating out calcium and magnesium carbonates to use as green cement. This process of making green cement, instead of producing a ton of CO2, it actually sequesters half a ton of CO2 for every ton of cement manufactured. So a good example of emulating that process of biomineralization. So if we were to look at an example of mimicking at the ecosystem level, uh, John Todd, um, John Todd's eco machines are a really good example of that. And those are emulating natural wetland ecosystems and that ecosystem service of cleaning water that wetlands perform. His eco-machines are actually tank-based systems um, that are housed in greenhouses. So the wastewater goes through a series of tanks that collectively have organisms from all the kingdoms. So they've got algae and bacteria and zooplankton and crabs and, I mean, you name it, fish, and, and then higher vascular plants as well. And what comes out is a cleaner water. I don't think it's used for drinking, but certainly can be used in landscaping um, without all the nasty chemicals. So this year's HOPES conference, one of the themes is to um, find patterns and make connections. And I thought, gosh, biomimicry and one of the tools that we use is a perfect thing to introduce here. And this is called life's principles. What this is are all the patterns that are found amongst species who are surviving and thriving on Earth today. So they're what biomimics use to kind of drive and evaluate the appropriateness or the sustainability of our designs. So these are patterns. There's 26 of them. We spend 12 weeks teaching a course in life's principles, so obviously I won't go into much detail, but I thought they were appropriate to bring up because they're often the patterns that we're really using to, um, to really assess is our, our design sustainable. Now, these were developed by an organization called Biomimicry 3.8 that's based in Helena, Montana, and they are a global leader in the practice and education of biomimicry. So I want to share a few of these life's principles and then some of the case studies that embody these life's principles. So the life's principle of being locally attuned and responsive is really about fitting in and integrating with the surrounding environment. So it's really about place, fitting into place. And the example here are saguaro cactus that are found in the Sonoran Desert. Now these cactus have this really extensive but shallow network of roots. So they're just poised to uptake the very heavy but infrequent rains that come. Now you can see the shape of them, they're, they're also kind of pleated. And what that pleating allows is that when they absorb moisture, those pleats can expand. In fact, they can absorb a ton of water after a heavy rainstorm. So it kind of begs the question of, well, what if we designed our water storage systems for adaptable distributed storage that was inspired after the saguaro. This has not yet been done. Maple leaves, or sorry, not maple leaves, maple fruit, this is actually a fruit that's composed of a seed and a wing. So maple fruits use the readily available energy of wind or even gravity to disperse away from the parent tree. And they do so by their seed right here, it's kind of heavy relative to the weight of the rest of the wing. They've got a long wing, and then they've got this rounded shape. 
A company called Sycamore Technologies, based out of uh, Sydney, Australia, has made this ceiling fan that rather than having three or four blades, like a typical ceiling fan, it really just has this one blade. And because it's got that same weight and length and balance ratio as the maple seed, it is able to spin at very slow speeds and use less energy while still ventilating a building really efficiently. When we leverage cyclic processes, that refers to taking advantage of um, kind of phenomena or processes that repeat themselves, like taking advantage of wave energy. So a company called Biosignal, um, or Bios, let me see, Biopower Systems, they um, are leveraging the cyclic processes of energy waves and currents, or ocean waves and currents. Okay, so they're looking at emulating a sea fan, the efficient propulsion of this shaped tail in fast swimming species like tuna and sharks, and then the hold fast anchoring system of kelp. So they've got a few biomimetic technologies out there. The first one's called BioWave. And the way BioWave works, it emulates that sea fan. It's anchored on the base, and it's capturing the energy of ocean currents and transferring them to electricity. They're able to lay down in a big storm surge so that they don't break. The second biomimetic technology is called BioStream. It mimics that efficient tail shape, and rather than moving through the water like a fish would, they're anchored in place, and they're capturing the energy of water moving by them. They also can, can move uh, with the direction of the current. And then both of these technologies are anchored with the third technology that's called BioBase, and it's modeled after that kelp hold fast, um, and it distributes the vertical and lateral loads into many different little units here. So biopower systems, um, are they occur in many places around the world. Um, this is a really good example, again, of mimicking form. Another life's principle is using form and fitting form to function. So this is a story about the humpback whale fin. So these, these whales are 40 to 50 feet long. They weigh 80,000 pounds. But despite their size, they can swim in circles tight enough that they release bubbles. And as they rise to the surface, it creates a net of bubbles that's only five feet wide. This is called bubble net feeding. And then all the whales come up underneath and they swim toward the surface inside that net of bubbles that's corralling their shrimp-like prey, and they come up for a feast. So this photo on the bottom is a picture of humpbacks as they've just risen to the surface after bubble net feeding. This is in Antarctica. So it begs the question, how do they make such tight circles? This guy in the center's name is Dr. Frank Fish. A uh, appropriate name for a man who studies the bumps or tubercles on the leading edge of the humpback whale fin. And what he's found in his studies is that those tubercles provide a 32% reduction in drag and an 8% increase in lift, allowing those tight circles at slow speeds. Whale Power is a company that's using tubercle technology inspired by the shape or form, again, of the humpback whale fin um, to improve efficiencies in wind turbines. And what they're finding is that these wind turbines can, can spin at much slower speeds than other turbines. So it's increasing annual energy production by 20%. Using life-friendly chemistry that does no harm to other organisms, any organisms, kind of seems like a no-brainer, but humans have created over 80,000 chemicals, um, most of which do not break down into benign constituents and instead leave toxic residues behind. This subset of the periodic table here, this table shows the elements that are most common in living organisms, including humans. 
and they're listed by their presence, their abundance, I should say, in humans or in living creatures. So the first row represents the most common elements in life. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. That's what most of our bodies are. That's what most of the bodies of living organ other living organisms are. The second row are elements that are present in life. Things like calcium, phosphorus, potassium, some of the salts. And those are really important to metabolic processes, to kind of our electrical um, functionality. The third row then are trace metals that are present in very low trace amounts. And then this last row are elements that are not very abundant. They're very sparse, but they are present in some organisms. This table is an example of green chemistry, which is kind of a new burgeoning field. Anybody heard of green chemistry before? A few hands. Um, so the efforts of green chemistry are to transfer our industrial chemistry that uses most of the elements on the periodic table, even the toxic ones, um, and, and shift those to only using the life-friendly elements on the periodic table. And creating compounds that break down into benign constituents, and we only do chemistry in water then, rather than using toxic solvents. So I want to show a couple case studies that use life-friendly chemistry. One is a story, a local story, um, plywood is made from taking layers of thin wood and gluing them together with an adhesive. And often that adhesive is formaldehyde based because it's um, waterproof and durable, but it's also very toxic to life. And so it kind of begs the question of, well, how does nature make a waterproof adhesive? Dr. Lee, who's from OSU, studied the blue mussels. Um, they occur in the intertidal zone on the Pacific, just off our coast. And what the blue mussel does is it puts out what's called a, a byssus thread. And out of that little attachment mechanism, it exudes a waterproof adhesive that's as strong as any human-made glue, um, but it's waterproof, and it's made of life-friendly chemistry the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, and the nitrogen. Okay, so what he's done is he's studied the recipe, so he's emulated the process, and he's licensed that technology called PureBond to Columbia Forest Products. And PureBond is a soy-based, formaldehyde-free, waterproof adhesive that Columbia is using for all their hardwood, plywood, and particle board manufacturing. Great success story of life-friendly chemistry. When I think of uh, shark skin, I had always envisioned kind of a racy, smooth texture, just because they're such agile little aquatic creatures, right? Well, it turns out that their skin, at least that of the Galapagos shark, is a lot more like this. This is a picture of shark skin under a scanning electron micrograph, and you can see the ridges called dermal denticels, um, what they do is they allow water to race through those grooves even when the shark is swimming around at fairly slow speeds. And it prevents bacteria from attaching. A company called Sharklet Technology has taken the shape of the shark skin and they've made an adhesive-backed film, basically, that is called Safe Touch and it's being applied in hospitals, and what they're finding is that the bacteria don't attach. So it's a way to not use toxic chemistry or not create antibiotics in order to repel bacteria, which is important in hospitals with all the concern about antibiotic resistance now. A third example of green chemistry is by uh, Really one of the founders of green chemistry on the left here is John Warner. He started the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry and he wrote the first book, textbook on green chemistry. And he recently came out with a technology that allows one to get rid of gray hair without using dyes. Because the dyes apparently have this long list of industrial chemicals and are quite toxic. 
So actually, this just came out last week. A company um, that the product is called this hair print. And what it does is rather than using dyes, it really just um, allows the natural pigment of our hair to kind of get reintegrated into the cortex of the hair. So it changes gray to one's natural hair color. So that's a pretty exciting, very hot off the press new discovery and, and technology. Uh, John Warner is also um, the starter, the founder of an organization called Beyond Benign. And it's an educational arm um, focusing on sustainability and green chemistry education. We have the privilege of next May working with John Warner. We're putting together a biomimicry and green chemistry week-long workshop um, on the East Coast at UMass. So if you have any interest in this, you can get a hold of me later. Um, but it'll be myself and Tim McGee, who's another certified biomimicry professional, and John Warner, and then a professor from UMass. Um, so that'll be an exciting uh, focus on biomimicry and green chemistry. So how do we move forward with an innovation approach that emulates nature's genius? I mean, how do you really do this? What is the practice of biomimicry? I want to tonight just suggest four steps. So we're all familiar with doing business and learning in silos. With biomimicry, we learn in interdisciplinary teams. Biomimicry is really about bringing together biologists, designers, engineers, and business folks. And kind of sharing the problem-solving approaches that we each use in our respective disciplines to kind of come together with um, collective collective solutions. So this is a group from our two-year biomimicry professional certification program. We have six one-week in-person sessions, and this is in Costa Rica in December. And what you've got here is an industrial designer slash biologist, a sustainability consultant, and a neuroscientist and patent attorney. So really, we come together as very diverse people. But what they've just done, what I, what I thought was worth showing here, is that they've just come back from exploring the forest. They've been inspired by the heliconia and a poison dart frog. They've pulled out their computers. They're doing more internet research on some of the strategies they saw, trying to understand how they work. They're pulling out our resources. And then they're moving toward emulating those principles that they've discovered um, in design concepts. So that's the first thing we do is work in interdisciplinary teams. The second thing we do is we make a point of trying to study in intact, beautiful areas that have multiple habitats that we can learn from. And we make an effort to quiet our cleverness and learn how to see without our eyes learn how to use all our senses to observe the natural world. And the reason we do this is that it gets us into the biology and the natural history so that then when we research, we learn a little bit more and it helps us leave behind the ways we've traditionally solved our problems. The third thing we do is we expand this concept of we to beyond humans to include the 30 million other species that we share the planet with. And really, there's no better long-term sustainability model out there than all the other life forms on the planet. And um, biomimicry is really about kind of learning a new way of valuing, learning from, and protecting those other life forms. And then the fourth thing we do is we go comb this database. This is called Ask Nature. It's a project of the Biomimicry Institute, which is a nonprofit based in Missoula, Montana. And it's a fantastic resource. I encourage all of you to get on it. It is organized, so it's basically biological strategies that are organized by engineering and design function. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm an architect, and I want to learn a new way to cool my building. 
So I could get into Ask Nature and I could say, how does nature cool? And it will come up with a bunch of different examples of how life cools that may be inspiration then for me for my designs. It also has application ideas and there's a database in there of biomimetic products if you want to learn more about that. So biomimicry is inspiring to me because it helps us imagine the possibilities. Possibilities such as creating efficient connective networks um, that are inspired by slime molds. This actually was done in Japan. Uh, some researchers laid down oat flakes on a map. The oat flakes went on all the cities and then they put a slime mold on there and the slime mold um, created a network that connected up to those food resources, the oat flakes, and it created a network that actually looked pretty similar to their railway system. So this can really help inspire um, uh, guide transportation system networks. Or learning how to de-ice without chemicals. This one is being tackled by Joanna Eisenberg at Harvard, and they're coming up with a nanostructure that can be put on plane wings that actually prevents ice formation rather than having to spray the nasty, um, toxic de-icer. And it's modeled after the hairs on the water strider and their water repellency. Or it's learning how to cooperate like honeybees. Uh, biology professor Dr. Celia Cornell is um, pretty inspired by this one and he's using the honeybee's decision-making processes um, to guide his meetings in the biology department. I know, who would, who would, who would think, right? So I want to close by saying that um, whether you're an innovator, somebody who designs our world or not, I think there's all kinds of things to be learned from taking time to observe the natural world. And that biomimicry's, one of biomimicry's greatest legacies will no doubt be a deepening respect for the natural world and our place in it. And the hope that it gives us for creating well-adapted designs that fit in. I want to just land here on my contact info if you want to learn any more about being a biologist um, or bringing a biologist to the design table and then share with you some kind of exciting um, learning opportunities if you'd like to learn more about biomimicry. So Biomimicry 3.8, you can go to their website, biomimicry.net. They have a two-year master's level program called the Biomimicry Professional Certification Program. And the online coursework is done through Arizona State University. And you get a master's. So you get a master's in biomimicry from doing all this online work. You get a, this professional certificate by going through this with this cohort. And you also get to go to six amazing places around the world and study with this small group of 20 people. So we're in the middle of a cohort right now. We're going to um, end in November in Botswana. So um, that's a pretty exciting program. Then there's the Biomimicry Specialist Program, and the coursework is, gives you a graduate certificate in biomimicry. Again, the coursework is online at ASU, but then you also take two one-week immersion courses. Or you can just come and take a one-week immersion course. Um, there's also smaller courses like a foundational course that's just an online course if you just want to learn a little bit more about biomimicry. So I encourage you to go to biomimicry.net if you'd like to learn any more about um, future biomimicry education opportunities. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm only at 38. Um, Quickly, if anyone has any uh, questions for Karen, you have to ask right now. I've answered all of them, huh? Well, so, yeah. yeah I've, I've heard of one major biomimetic example in architecture, and that's some um, folks who looked at needle wings and harvesting water. Uh, mm. It's a project I've heard about in the Middle East, and so mm -hmm. um, specifics. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you knew of any other large-scale pattern implementations beyond the product design realm. 
Yeah, I think what you're referring to is the fog harvesting that's inspired by the Namibian beetle that raises its wings and, and gathers fog that condenses onto its wings and runs into its mouth. There's a lot of examples in architecture. And tomorrow at noon, Michael Pollan, who's this amazing biomimic and architect, is going to be speaking. Um, trying to think of other good examples of biomimicry and architecture. Um, uh, you, you know, what's common in architecture is what we call biomorphic design. So it's something that looks like an organism, but it doesn't necessarily function like an organism. Um, so one of, one of the technologies that I really like, it's not so much in building a building, but it's putting on the side of a building. It's called Smith, and it uh, basically it emulates ivy climbing the side of a building. Um, and it's an energy harvesting system that's multifunctional. It, it gathers um, sunlight, so it's solar cells, but it also has, um, when the leaves flutter in the wind, there's a piezoelectric generator at the base, so it's also harvesting wind energy. Um, yeah, I'd encourage you to listen to Michael Pollan. And Michael Pollan also has a TED Talk where he talks a lot about um, biomimicry in architecture. It's, it's a group of designers who tends to be very interested in biomimicry. You know, if you look at the, the designers of our world, let's say architects, industrial designers who design the stuff of our world, they tend to be real interested in it. But architecture, because so many of our buildings can be um, well adapted to place, they tend to have a, a real big interest in that. It's not so much my forte, though, as a biologist. So, that's why I'm not rattling off one example after another for you. <laughs> also, Michael Pollan wrote a book called um, Biomimicry in Architecture, right? And I have not seen that yet, but that might be a good source for you. Uh, the Landscape Architecture Program is actually competing with Biomimicry Design Challenge. Oh, great! Which is dealing with food systems. Yes. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak to some examples within food systems well, before I answer that, and I have a couple of a couple ideas, um, tell me what your student group is. Or have you come up with an idea to move forward with, or are you just fishing right now? We're yeah, we're just learning about systems and talking about systems. And just yesterday, we divided ourselves into groups. So now that we've divided ourselves into groups, I think. That's great. So what she's referring to is what's called the Global Design Challenge. It's put on by the Biomimicry Institute. It's one of their three main initiatives. And this year's focus is on food security. And if you go to their website, they actually have quite a few resources there. You know, I think, I think there's a lot of issues with food, right? Um, certainly a model that I find really inspiring is permaculture and the idea of creating a mixed polyculture where, you know, if you take the extreme of our agricultural system of monocultures, right, where we level everything that existed before, we eliminate all the native species and the diversity of native species, and then we just plant our crop and we load it with fossil fuel, right, whether it's nitrogen or, you know, pesticides and fertilizers. And so, you know, there's huge food security issues around that strategy. That isn't working. We're losing soil. We're losing soil fertility. I mean, that's the biggest thing. So even if you focus on soil fertility, that's huge. Um, but, but permaculture kind of goes to the other extreme where it's looking at what would the native diversity be in a system? What would those strata be? So what would the native herbs, shrubs, trees, and in some ecosystems, like the tropics, vines. Vines and epiphytes, you know, those air plants that attach to trees, those are a real integral part of those systems. And how can we not only leave those natural systems, but create food analogs for those so that all the functions of that system are being performed, but we're also growing food. So for instance, uh, vanilla is an epiphyte. Well, let's put vanilla on some of the trees and grow vanilla. Um, 
So anyway, there's some great examples. I could send you a good example from, I spent a lot of time in Belize and studying permaculture and you know teaching a nine week uh, natural history ecology course, but the last week was always permaculture. So there's lots of great examples in the tropics. Um, so I think that's a great path. I'm also real intrigued by something that a woman in Bend, where I live over the mountains, is doing. She's looking at food waste. And I don't know exactly what sources she's able to, you know, I think there's a lot of regulations in place with food waste. Well, some food waste cannot get reserved, but some of it apparently can. And again, I don't know the nitty gritty of that, but what she's trying to do is hook up the flows of food waste and those sources with the needs, the food needs, and connect those up. Um, I think using social media, using mapping, using, you know, so it's not so much that we don't have enough food, but it's improving the system of our food delivery and food waste structure. So I'm really intrigued by that. Um, I think there's some opportunities there. I think there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of talk now um, with urban agriculture, creating vertical agriculture. Again, there's somebody in Bend that's really working on vertical agriculture, but that really has a lot of potential sources or potential um, solutions for dense urban areas. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential there as globally we are, as a human population, we're moving into urban areas for various reasons. But because of that shift, it's like, how can we improve urban agriculture? Um, you know, what, what is it what is it to grow food on more of the micro scales, you know, and more distributed rather than have these huge plots of land um, and then distribute those large distances and have all these food miles. So I don't know, lots of, lots of things to explore around that. But I'd encourage other people to look into that food challenge. Go to the Biomimicry Institute's website. It's biomimicry.org, and it'll pop right up. It's the first thing that you'll see. And you can really drill into that global biomimicry challenge. Yep. Um, I had a question, it might be for the model, but um, I had a question relating to water and architecture. One thing we have to deal with is presenting rock in the building. And most uh -huh. of the uh, situations that we have now, we just not very uh, environmentally friendly, um, jet flashing, metal flashing, and car-based membrane. Uh -huh. Is there any sort of biomimicry technology out there that would be focused on shedding water that can be applied? I don't know. It's a good question for Michael Pollan tomorrow. Um, so the question was, are there good examples of shedding water, biomimetic solutions for shedding water off buildings? I'm thinking of, of a design I saw by HOK Architects, and this was just a concept um, that actually did the reverse of that. It wasn't so much shedding, but it was saying, okay, we get all this water that flows off our buildings and then runs off. How can we slow that flow? And they looked at beaver dams and the way that beaver dams slow flow but also allow a little bit of leakage. And they designed, again, just a concept, but it was a... Um, it was kind of a, a residential, you know, commercial residential area. So there's lots of buildings and they had connected up these beaver dams to kind of slow the flow so that that water could get collected and used. Again, it's kind of the opposite of what you're saying, but um, <coughs> that's, that's one thing I'm, I'm thinking of. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Um, and to do with biomimicry, uh -huh. but I was wondering, I think we're kind of, I think interdisciplinary work is kind of difficult to do, but I was wondering if there's like a model that kind of worked for you, or like a, I don't know, how these different people from different backgrounds can come together. What do you think is the hardest part of interdisciplinary work? I don't know, I think we're trying to do that in, this, in our school too, but sometimes it's not as successful as we want to be. Because, just communicating? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it takes, it's, it's hard, right? I mean, it's easier to work with like-minded people, right? Oh, you're a biologist too, you know how to dive into the primary literature and blah, blah, blah. 
Well, I can learn a lot from working with an architect or an industrial designer. Um, so I guess the success that I've seen is working with students in our two-year program or our eight-month program where we get people from all different disciplines and we take the time to sit down. So sometimes it'll be exercises where we go out into the Sonoran Desert and we find inspiration in, you know, uh, a certain type of cactus and then we research the biology. Well, maybe the biologist can do that faster but that doesn't mean the industrial designer doesn't want to learn how to do it, right? And so there's still a way for that person to learn how to research the biology by going into, you know, natural history books rather than diving into the primary literature. So it's teaching people what to look for. So it's thinking about um, what's the function that that cactus is performing. Oh, it's collecting water. How does it collect water? Well, the strategy, it has this rosette shape, and those leaves are funneling water down to the base. And then helping them kind of translate that into a really simple design principle, um, multiple leaves that are in a rosette shape that funnel water to the base of the plant help collect water then they can take that into their design. Well, the designer might run with it. The architect in the group might just run with the design. Well, that's great, because as a biologist, I'm not that great of a drawer. You know? So you, you end up kind of taking the lead with what you're good at, but you also kind of allow the space to te help teach each other. Um, and I think you know, really the key is being able to study a week together. It's not like we go to class and then we go, off, we go home and we go to our job and you know, it's like we're together 24 seven for an entire week and that really helps too. But it's hard, it's hard, yeah, it's not easy, but it's fun, you know, it's fun to learn how, how a business person thinks, you know, that's not my realm. So it's really fun to, to talk to people from different disciplines. And I think just have that open-mindedness and curiosity is what helps make it work. And, and being willing to take the extra time it takes to work in teams. It does take more time than sometimes whipping it off yourself. Yeah. I'm curious how you see Brandon Creek entering more mainstream business fields. Um, I think it's been kind of slow and kind of a niche in its start. Uh -huh. How do you see it being adopted uh, more you know, wide, widespread? Mm. I think just bit by bit, you know, I think it's a really young discipline, um, but it's a really old practice. So there's a level of common sense to it. I think a lot of people go, well, yeah, duh. You know, indigenous people have been doing that for centuries, right? Um, but I think it's just going to be slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, and I think that's often how a lot of change occurs until there's a tipping point. Um, so giving talks like this. You know, you going out and telling your friend, you know, digging into Ask Nature, you know, taking on the student design challenge. Um, so I just think it, it's, it's taking time. Yeah, but I don't know that there'll be any magical event. I mean, there's already people like John Warner, who I described, who, you know, he's won the Perkins Award, and, you know, for green chemistry. And Jeanine Benius, you know, all these people are winning these amazing global awards. So... That helps, certainly. But I think it's, um, you know, little innovations that inspire you. Um, and I think really right now what's happening is people are starting to incorporate a new way of thinking. And that takes time. And once that new way of thinking starts getting integrated, then change will start to happen much more rapidly. So... I wish there was some magical silver bullet, but I don't know that there is. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all the questions. Uh, thank you, Carrie Allen, again for coming. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me.